I don't like sharing wild places when I walk. Isolation and solitude in the wilderness are something I became addicted to many decades ago. At first, in the Nullarbor Desert when I was just 17 years old. No, wait. The need for isolation and solitude started long before that. That's what drove me to the Nullarbor. It started in the working class inner city suburb of Elwood in Melbourne where I grew up. There was no wilderness there, no desert or far-reaching plains, but there was the rooftop of our single weatherboard house, and I was up there often, intuitively, running to the highest point like a startled goanna in order to escape all the brain noise down at human level. At other times, when the Melbourne weather was inclement, which was often, I would climb the rickety wooden ladder in Mum's sewing workroom to gain access to the only silent tomb available in our overcrowded house, the attic. It was no more than the space between the cross members that held up the laths and the plaster of the high ceilings and the frames under the pinnacle of the roof. There was no standing room even in the centre pitch, but my parents had made good use of the real estate by laying old floorboards and sheets of chipboard over nearly every square inch to create storage for the hundreds of bolts of leftover brocades and vinyl materials from their upholstery business and any other thing that fitted up through that tiny manhole. This was the best place to escape a house stacked to the roof in every room with half-finished dressed furniture and five kids all born about a year apart in the early to mid-1960s. If you know about this feeling that I'm speaking of in the wilderness, this need to be alone in order to stay sane, you know that we will find it come hell or high water somewhere, even if it's in a cupboard. There is another level to this interface we can have with being alone in a space that many of us never discover simply because we don't get the chance to experience it. It's a deepening of that instinct. Many people never leave the city limits or if they do it's in a kind of a group or a team of adventurers you know on a bus on a special trip an outing and they think that going for a walk in the bush with other hikers or park or a busy national park in the middle of the day on a walking track is what I mean you know it's a tour but it's not it feels like wilderness but there are these little safety nets everywhere to reassure you that a human being has put up this rail this sign cut this path for us so it's all okay it's quite safe we've all heard about the idea of the Australian Aborigines going walkabout well I imagine this is more so what I'm talking about. It's not a group walk. It's not a team marathon with a goal or an outcome in mind with all sorts of fizzy electrolyte drink stops on the way. It's a deliberate wandering off into the raw wilderness on your own, on purpose. Once you have done this enough, you know that the desire to be in it can't be changed once it has taken up residence in you as a thing you need. You never get over it. It calls you. It dictates your life. You will serve it in how you live your life and where you live your life. If it can't be had, you become sickly and anemic like a caged kangaroo who must be able to bound across open plains. You can't get it in public spaces like parks or gardens because the secret between wilderness and solitude requires that you cannot be a share of this space. Unless, of course, you go out at the early hours of the morning and there's not a soul around and then you can tap into it. Today was my last day on Tampering Mountain, so I opted for the one-hour Curtis Falls walk before I loaded up the car to head back along the concrete slipstream to the trashy Golden Coast. I rose before daylight at 4.30. I put my running gear on and squeezed in a quick coffee. 
Daybreak was alive for only 30 minutes by the time I arrived at the empty car park and the entrance to the National Park. There are two distinctive experiences for me when it comes to being in the bush. They are like chalk and cheese. One is blissfully alone and the other is with others around. The former I am addicted to and cannot live sanely without regular doses of, and the latter I avoid at all costs. In fact, tolerate at best if the others are my friends or family, otherwise I abhor it. For some, wandering alone in the wilderness has no appeal at all and might even be seen as evidence of having had an accident or possibly being lost. I have often wondered why on earth everyone waits until the hottest, busiest or noisiest part of the day to hit the walking trails or parks. Not only that, they insist on dragging food with them for a picnic. Why the hell would you have a picnic in a place where flies are like crossbreeds between kamikaze pilots and pterodactyls? Just eat at home, I say, or in the car and things will be far better, believe me. But then that's just me. So much could be said about the ceremony of the picnic in the park as a terrific experience. But I'm just telling you how it is for me. Perhaps people feel safer in groups, as surely then nothing bad will happen when there are witnesses around. More likely, when they are all together, she, that frightening presence, is not really there or felt. They congregate at crowded beaches and fight for small square inches of towel space when an empty one sits a few miles away. They squash themselves into piles and corners of concrete pylons and dream about sleeping in small noisy boxes called apartments overlooking thousands of other concrete boxes. They swarm in swamps of retail detail or kilometres of queues for crappy coffee in cities where they could just make a cup at home in a fraction of the time and cost. But it's not the same, they cry, as when Paul or Ronaldo makes it. I'm sure it's more about the name dropping than the coffee. They mull around each other, swimming and hoarding comfort or succor or something I just don't understand from the mass and froth of itself. It terrifies me. It confuses and exhausts me trying to work out why. I have wondered why even before I had deliberately left it behind at 16 years old to find something else, that I did not yet know of, but just knew must be out there. And yet they seemed to find warmth and comfort in this mulling around together. I felt like I was born in the wrong world. And yet all my calls from the roof of my inner city childhood home to be beamed up and taken home came to naught. What am I talking about here? What is the thing that we may come to know that will not allow us to go back? What seduces us in the wilderness and glues itself into our psyche, forming a kind of Baroque extra sense that must be satisfied, but which we cannot explain? You find you have a tail curled up in your pants leg and it's highly uncomfortable unless you can just let it out to flap around as your real full self instead of tucking it in all the time to fit in with everyone else. Perish the thought. Is it insight or is it just a general distrust of the limits of human beings in crowds and packs? Am I talking about a club of nature elitists or extreme greenism? No, because they too flock in packs or bow down to worship that which does not give a fig for their efforts, really. Is it a mental illness? Maybe, but I don't care because I know what is real, but I know that it is not common. Therefore, never expect to gain widespread consensus. If it was more common, perhaps we would not be in the mess we're in with the environment and our constant raising of it to serve the other. 
I've seen Mother Nature's, or whatever she is, true face hide from people many times. In fact, any time others are around. Perhaps this elusive behaviour is why she ends up in trouble and at the mercy of unseeing coveting and reaping for selfish gain. Miners seem to have special permission to do whatever the hell they want to nature. Rip it up, tear it down, burn it, poison the water, steal the water, steal the soil, ship it all away and then leave great gaping scars everywhere. And what for? For clean energy scams, sanctioned by corrupt and paid off or blackmailed government ministers and stupid gold watch hunting bureaucrats? So they can dig up rare earth, turn it into things that poison the planet such as lithium batteries, forcing everyone to buy, 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 then only to discover they poisoned the planet at a rate of 100 times that which an oil run car does. It's all a gigantic scam, a rich man's trick where the people are given all sorts of guide rails and rules to follow, but those destroying the place are given carte blanche with no regulations to eat and rip up the world into extinction. But lock it up, the globalists say, while handing the keys to the rapists and crooks and then forcing us all to buy the crap they make and removing everything that used to last. One toaster really should last us a lifetime. The One World Government goons, including the United Nations and the World Economic Forum, full of narcissistic, greedy parasites with their agenda 20, 30, 50, or whatever fantasy number they deem the number, has stated blatantly they wish to lock up 90% of all wilderness from the public. You, you soft-footed devil, cannot go there, but steel-tracked bulldozers with rippers can. They herd the plebs, the great unwashed, as we are apparently, into tiny boxes in huge cities and feed us insects and plug our brains into a matrix-like gaming existence of fantastic virtual worlds. But of course mining will continue because the globalists and their corporate cronies pocket the kickback, Matt. It is their currency. Why bother with us at all? Why not just wipe all of we useless eaters out? Feeding us insects and entertaining us so we don't revolt is expensive. Why keep these living corpses that we are and no longer useful human beings alive at all? We just consume and given they have automated our work, we have no reason to exist. We'll be miserable anyway. Surely it would be far more viable to just knock us all off to implant some slow-acting pesticide or blow something into the air or into the food so it's not detectable rather than feeding us and keeping us alive. For unless they use our bodies for some purpose, what is the point? And that might in fact be exactly what they have been planning and are in the midst of executing. Unless we identify them quickly, and work out how to dig out this spreading terminal cancer in our governments and businesses across the world, we have no hope. And the problem with digging them out is that they know very well that if they can be got at, they will be got at. And therefore they hide behind these global, not-for-profit organisations that were never elected, they're self-nominated and they bribe their way into getting diplomatic immunity in places like Switzerland where their bank accounts can never be looked at, nothing can ever be looked at. I mean how convenient is that? But do they think that that will protect them once we realise who they are and what they're doing?
back to nature, as I'm quite sure she has her own plans, which are not planned so much as just shit she does despite man's plans. When there are batches of people who come into her wilderness, she is wary and stiff. If miners want to go in there and drill holes in her belly, scrape out all of her insides and then pour all their dirty water and crap back into her again, she will not scream or yell. She'll deliver to those who did this the result. You'll go there and see your own filthy work, your own mess, your defamation of her body. How you think or feel about that, she doesn't even care. We are a collective in light of Mother Nature. You might be sad and cry, but the corporate miner or globalist pig does not give a fig about that. Nature won't punish them. Therefore, any justice must be fought by the factions within humanity. We must be a self-regulating creature. That is our responsibility. And passing it off to some biblical prophecy is foolery and part of the trick that we might pacify ourselves knowing that this is God's plan. That's the trick. That's what they're pulling over us. That's why all the religious dogma. If we are offended by the actions of our fellow man, then we have to adjust the dirty part of our collective body, our species. We can't save her as she is not a victim. She's a mirror into which we can see the reflection of our own deeds. We can only rout out the cancers in our collective that harm the earth that nurtures us. People must regulate people. We do not tolerate murderers, so why do we tolerate those who make our world filthy and dark? Be warned. The globalist culprits know this very well and have laid claim to the cause of cleaning up the mess they are making but blaming you for making. You consuming monster you. They are charlatans, fraudsters and con artists setting themselves up into a position of controlling your mind so you do not come after them. All they want to do is stop you from stopping them. They have no concern for green causes, wokeness, fair pay, net zero or clean energy. The irony of it all is always their sick jokes. Net zero is in fact extinction and the complete devastation of all life on earth. Yep, this is a joke they're pulling on you while they gouge out the beautiful planet to fill their stooge-like coffers and they want to keep it all to themselves. They don't want the responsibility of having encouraged you to breed and profligate and now they don't want you anymore. They wanted you as consumers to make them rich and now they don't. They've captured the morality around their foul deeds, captured our guilt and gaslit us all into getting down on our knees and sorting out the milk cartons from the lawn clippings and shaming anyone that dares put an egg carton in the wrong bin. But hop on to Amazon.com and pick up a toaster for $20. If you love Mother Nature and care for her, even if she does not roll around in front of you in the dust like a happy horse and then rise up as high as a mountain like an eagle or cockatoo and flap her wings furiously for the pure joy of drying off after a rain shower or her bath. Even if she does not shake her giant mane head, ruffling her fur into a big fluffy collar to impress you. And if she does not scratch the fleas from her ears in front of you or even me, she will do it if you be alone with her to prove she is there. You have to be alone 
or maybe only with your sniffing dog, your panting horse or canoodling cat to see these things, to feel what she's like. Animals want to go inside her. They're inseparable. They want to play and you can see just how a dog reacts if you take them there. If you are even allowed to these days, they are gleeful and changed with an encounter because they trust her and she trusts them too. They are indivisible and they don't read signs, even as killers. To be alone with Mother Nature is not to examine her. The difference is like night and day, to have or to not have. It's the difference between a plastic cow and a real one. It's about temperatures, smells, wet rotting and baking dry things, feather softness, tiny and gigantic prickles and sharp edges, things that cannot be separated from each other for investigations, bristles and silk, hidden small scuttering under mist, thudding and pounding, moaning and peeling, busting apart, spraying pockets of gamey smells where animals have lain and marked, and other things that are not in the barista shop which is limited to man's imagination about one or two topics, mostly Ronaldo and Paul. Nothing will cure you of the need to be alone with her if she knows you like this and you know her like this. But if others are there, if a young Chinese couple are walking together giggling along the track and taking photos of giant trees and cockatoos, or a happy family are skipping along with their sun hats, a tourist bureau map enjoying a jolly day out while they eat Pringles and drink their sugar poppers, she probably won't come to you like this. She is there, oh yes, but she hides behind her special masks, a kind of cloak of anonymity with very, very important park rangers signposts and painted arrows pointing this way and that. Where people should walk and not walk. The rangers probably know about how shy she is because no doubt most of them walk alone many times in her places. Doing their work and so they work for her and also the council. And they set up all this so she can hide when all the visitors come. When they come, she measures the footfall. She listens. One, two, or more. If it is not one who is listening, she pretends she is just big wood, birds and dirt and stuff. She's an actress and she wears costumes and makeup for the visitors with the nicely paved steep bits and cleared paths. She has a few special party tricks, such as Roger, who is a bush turkey stationed at the corner of tree number 543 and he does this thing where he runs across the scrub scaring the shit out of the walkers every time because they think something is coming something they can't see until they see him there is a hooting owl named Bert located at about position 27 degrees 55 28.4 south and 153 degrees 11 and 36.1 east and he does his thing each day and they all think it's a ghost as he keeps moving positions so they can't find him but only hear his haunting hoots floating around the forest. She plays the game that the rangers name this way to the falls, this way to the lookout, this way to the contemplative spot, and that way to the car park. Do not go here. No entry. Keep out. Rehabilitation. One kilometre return trip, grade three. This business of how she plays chicken in the presence of those who don't know her is tricky to understand. You might ask, well, how do I get to know her if she disappears when I come to see her? How will I ever know her properly? Well, it's very easy. You have to go alone without any friends or family or traveling groups or tours. And you have to go there, not be going anywhere. If you're scared, so is she. She won't trust you. And she might smell it like a dog smells fear. She's far more benevolent, or should I say indifferent than a dog though, who might bite you for being scared. And if you give it long enough and walk in there anyway, even with your fear, 
but trusting her to sort it out, it will all gradually and then suddenly be good. She has a way of doing that. You just get used to her being around and she accepts you. Just being around and then she's your friend. She'll let you touch her properly. You can walk over and pick up things that she won't mind. If you are not at home when you go there, she won't make you a home until you are home there. Why do I need to go alone, you might ask? It's because this is when we are not with anyone else but her. That is how we know her. That is how she reveals herself to us. It is all she trusts, truly, deeply. I'm not lying to you. It's very specific. I have to ask you this, and it might help to understand a little bit about why all this is so tricky and lonesome and yet really so easy. Where do you think you go when you die? Will you die taking all your gang with you? Your car and your iPhone, perhaps? Probably not. You will return to matter, to nature, in some form or another. You will return to her world. No matter what you believe, she will, at the very least, have your body. So why would you not be at ease with her eternal rotting and sprouting? Why won't you trust her now, before you have no choice? To go and sit somewhere, just out in the bush, on the ground, at no place in particular, away from the signposts, is a good start. Lie down and put your head on the ground, your ear in the dirt, and close your eyes. Just check there are no bull ant nests first, though, eh? <laughs> Sit or lay there and wait. She will come. She will come, creasing in, invisibly at first, until she has you surrounded. And it is only an intruder that can make you realise she has had you all the time, because upon the presence of someone else, she becomes silent and evaporates, and you will know this if you have known her alone with your full concentration. It is the most intimate of all intimacies. As soon as you are there on your own again, she will come back. You can learn this by doing it and observing it, that's all. Most of us don't even know it's possible, that it's something in this world to know, to feel, to have in us. My worry is that the monsters who are operating to shut down this experience for we humans by closing wilderness are indeed in the process of trying to kill us by using the most foul of all methods, that of attempting to destroy the core of our very soul, our connection to nature, by shutting out our sacred relationship to wilderness and pretty much our connection to all that is sacred and makes life worth living, whether or not we do have this deeper awareness, they cut the miracle from our existence. We will have no will to live. And that is their aim, believe me. They are shooting for collective suicide to destroy the meaning of life so they can wash their hands of the foul deed. They get away with this because people are unaware of this sacred relationship we have with wild places and mistakenly think by going along with their plans they are doing green things good things for the environment when they are in fact helping the monsters kill us we are a part or child of nature whether we are conscious of it or not And now to wind up the story. Platypus. I trekked quietly downwards on the path, once at the bottom of the rainforest, where the roaring falls should have been, but were not thanks to a record-breaking drought. Walkers had to cross the stream via 20 feet of rocks and leaps in order to begin the ascent back up on the other side. As I am alone, or only with my dogs most of the time that I am trooping around in the bush, I've learned to be very sure-footed to reduce the chances of a stupid slip or fall. Therefore, as I descended, I was focused on the space between the rock I was on and the next one. 
when a flash of something odd appeared in the corner of my eye. I froze and focused more carefully at the little rock pool in front of me. A slug-like thing emerged, and yet didn't really emerge at all. It was as if it was a bubble of dark, swollen water, moving purposefully and in pace with the current. I felt excited and focused carefully, waiting for it to appear again. I wasn't expecting anything. There, there it was again and again. Then it went under and it slid over the rocks and down into the next small pool and the next. I didn't even think to get my phone out to take a video or a photo. I was just engrossed in the moment. Who hasn't seen one of these in books and on the TV? But never in the context of size, as they are very elusive and not exactly a petting type animal one would have in a cage. It was a platypus, but it was so small. The paddle tail was not huge, but it was a paddle. I could see his little duckbill snout and just before my last sighting he rolled slightly sideways to look at me. I saw his eye, but it was ethereal as if in a dream. There it was, the little hero of the book I've been writing all my life, The Child in the Cave, and the one that I'd been poring over during this particular trip, the very same escort who would take the child in the story to safety was here right in front of me, showing me what he really looks like, what he does, how he rolls, how like Quicksilver he really is. It's as if he is there, but he is not there. His body rises up and carries the water over him, so it's not separate. Like a freshly laid egg, the yolk sits proud inside the white, but it is protected by this slippery coating. It just rises, this glistening body down into the little pool and then through it and down over the rocks again he goes. The tiny raw umber god who lives above and below, who moves like mercury, so slippery and impossible to catch. He is the little Hermes of the low clear creeks, working away mysteriously, appearing and disappearing and seeing everything. After that, it was time to go home.